So I'd like to welcome all of you here tonight on behalf of the George and Irina Schaefer Center for the Study of Genocide, Human Rights, and Conflict Prevention. Um, where tonight we're going to have a lecture by Anna Alexanian, and I'm going to let Boris Ajamian uh, introduce her. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of words before the lecture tonight. We're really happy to have uh, Anna today, tonight here. We're also really happy because um, Boris is teaching right this second a class on the Armenian Genocide, History, Memory, and Politics. Boris is a historian and director of the AGBU Nubar Library here in Paris. He's also editor-in-chief of Etude Armenienne Contemporain, or uh, Armenian Contemporary Armenian Studies. It's a bilingual journal in history. Um, the other thing that I'd just like to let you guys know is that we'll have, um, thanks to Boris, we're going to have a second lecture um, next week, um, next Wednesday at the same time, that you're all invited to. Um, and in addition to the class, um, and I see many of the students here that are going to be going with us to Yerevan um, as part of the class. And then the last thing that you should be aware about, and there's probably more, is that we're also organizing a conference on April 24th and 25th um, here at AUP um, called uh, Thinking Genocide um, on the Armenian Genocide in the Ottoman Empire. So and I'm hoping as well too, students, if you're interested in that um, and interested in helping, um, there's opportunities for students to get involved and I'd encourage you to ask Boris or to ask me. So welcome Boris and welcome Anna. Thank you, Brian. So, uh, uh, and thank you also for uh, hosting this event and making it possible. Uh, so Anna, uh, a few words about Anna. Anna Alexanian is a historian. She is currently a PhD candidate at the Strasler Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University. And uh, Anna is, uh, in my opinion, representing a new generation of scholars uh, working on the Armenian Genocide. Hello. Hello. Uh, so I was saying a new generation uh, that is opening new new path, new ways to explore this past, dealing with topics which were hitherto left uh, aside. And her PhD explores gendered aspects of the Armenian genocide. So even though, as you can see, she is a young scholar, Anna has already accumulated a rich experience in the field of genocide studies, and she worked. Uh, among other things, she, she worked several years at the Armenian Genocide Museum Institute as a scientific researcher. Also, she awarded in 2018 a grant by Vartan Gregorian Scholarship uh, Research Grants Program. Uh, and I wanted to say uh, some, uh, a few words uh, more general uh, about the, the historiography of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, although the Armenian Genocide is one century old, uh, the research on this issue is still quite young compared to uh, the historiography of the Jewish genocide. It was and still is sometimes uh, isolated as a field of research and has for long remained focus, focused on the necessity to bring about evidences of its historical reality, that it did exist. Uh, uh, now this is more or less behind us, this kind of approach and younger scholars are addressing new topics, developing research in a more comparative approach, and are able to reach a higher level of conceptualization. And uh, Anna is one of these new generation of scholars. She is also epitomizing a new generation of researchers coming from Armenia, and hopefully uh, epitomizing also the input of scholars from Armenia, the growing input uh, of these people in the research on the Armenian Genocide. She studied first at Yerevan State University and now in the USA. Uh, she's also giving a class at the American University in Armenia and is involved in the organization of a study trip, the study trip that you mentioned, Brian. Uh, so the study trip where some of you uh, uh, 
will participate uh, in Armenia in next April, and we will have the pleasure to have a visit of the uh, Armenian Genocide Museum and Institute, thanks to uh, Anna. So now I'm giving the floor to Anna for her lecture about gender aspects of the Armenian Genocide in the experiences of its victimized females. Thank you. generous introduction and I want to thank um, the center uh, and also uh, Brian and Boris for making my um, uh, making this possible actually thank you very much and uh, yeah so gender aspects of the Armenian genocide in the experiences of its victims female before uh, going uh, to the details, I would like to share with you a, uh, the following. In the Armenian language, when you, we have a word uh, which means an orphan. We have also a word uh, IV, which means a widow. And we have a word Vorhevairi, which means an orphan and a widow. So before the genocide, uh, this world, Vorpevairi, was um, addressed to a man or a woman who lost uh, their husband or a wife. But interestingly, during the Armenian genocide and after the Armenian genocide, uh, Vorpevairi became a word to describe a woman who lost entire her family. So. It changed its uh, linguistic, uh, let's say, meaning. And if you go uh, and check in the Armenian dictionaries before the genocide, you will see the description of this world. Uh, but after the genocide and later, you will see how the description was changed. Uh, changed. And this says something about the gender nature of the Armenian genocide, which I'm going to talk about today. So, this is the map of uh, the Ottoman Empire at the beginning of the 20th century. You see a very colorful map. I took it from the uh, webpage rushanmaidan.org and Vahe Tashjan, who is going to be here next week, and we are very lucky to have him. Uh, he is one of the founders of this uh, wonderful project, and uh, the website uh, is uh, actually, it gives you a lot of information about Armenian life before the genocide, Armen Ottoman Armenian life. And this uh, colorful, um, map, as I said, is a map of the Ottoman Empire and uh, Armenians were living almost everywhere in the Ottoman Empire. But most importantly, they were living in the territories of historical Armenia, uh, Western Armenia, as uh, uh, Armenians would say, uh, which is eastern part of the empire. And uh, six uh, main provinces were uh, the provinces for indigenous Armenian people living in the empire. And um, these provinces are Erzurum, Van, Diyarbakir, um, uh, Sivas, um, Solmush. And from the, uh, from the first glance, you would think that living inside of the same empire, it means that they have the same habits, the same you know, language, the way of living, but no. They were Armenians, they had similarities, but they were also very different. They were speaking different dialects, uh, and sometimes they were very different um, in the way of uh, having um, organizing their lives, um, marrying, etc. I will bring only one example, the example of uh, the, from the province of Mush and uh, Harper. Um, um, which are uh, neighbors, the provinces. Uh, Mashiti Armenians were very conservative, very, very conservative. And uh, when the Armenian um, patriarch, a uh, very famous Armenian patriarch, Kherimian um, Haidik, uh, went to establish a girls' school in that province, 
they decided to assassinate him because that w was something that was unusual for that province and they thought it's something shameful and they will not allow their girls to go and study in a, uh, in a school. So, but the, the picture is different in Harpert when in the middle of uh, 18th century American and foreign missionaries established uh, schools and uh, they were uh, girls schools also and girls were um, having, um, they were very well educated, they had their local newspaper that they were publishing and um, to um, also compete with these foreign um, schools actually. Armenian uh, national organizations started to also develop uh, national education. So which in impact the entire region and Armenian girls became more and more educated. So just uh, to have an idea about how different they were. And but uh, during the genocide they had to share the same fate. So what was the position of Ottoman Armenian women before the genocide? Um, we discussed about it today during uh, the class. Um, Ottoman um, Armenians, uh, of course, they didn't have the same rights as Ottoman Muslims, and it cons concerned also the marriage. Um, simply, Ottoman Muslim men could marry an Ottoman Armenian woman, but never vice versa. Never Armenian men could marry a Muslim woman, which was a crime and punished by death. And um, um, in the eastern provinces of the Ottoman Empire, where Armenia most of them lived, um, there was a law of uh, <laughs> under the law, which was the law of Aras or um, the law of Kurdish. Um, nobles who were ruling the, uh, the region. What I want to say is that if there was a law um, to pay um, to the state certain amount of money uh, during the year and there, there was an unwritten law by these uh, ahas who would demand more money and sometimes women uh, to, to be paid to them to live in that region peacefully. So, and in 1878, this is what um, Boros Natanian uh, wrote about the situation of Armenian women um, in, in that very provinces. So if they couldn't take um, First, they were trying to take Armenian women. If they couldn't take them, they were, uh, of course, humiliating um, Armenian men. But something happened in 1889, which changed the history of the region. So, you see uh, the girl, her name is Armenuhi. So she was 14 years old, from that very province, from Mush, a very conservative, and she was kidnapped by a local famous Kurdish Ara, Musabek. She was kept, she was forced to marry him, and her name was changed. She became Gulizar, and she was forced to live with him for four years. And then she escaped. She came back uh, to her community, and it was to bring also danger for the entire community. Because Kurds, and especially soldiers, let's say, who were serving this Aha, this bay came after her. And the Armenian community stand to protect her. They um, not only protected her, but took her to Istanbul, Constantinople, to um, legally claim her back to the Armenian community. About 80 people went there to support Gulizar, 
And it was the first time in the Ottoman Empire history that women, a woman who was um, kidnapped, forcibly married, stand in front of her, um, 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 of the perpetrator of Musabeh and said what happened to her and said that she wanted to come back to her community. It was a successful trial and after which Gulizar uh, was freed and she was returned to the community. This was a turning point in um, Ottoman Armenian society life. They were also um, a lot uh, of response from uh, European representatives of Istanbul who were there at that time. They were surprised how Ottoman court actually freed uh, uh, Gulizar and returned her to Armenian community. And this story doesn't end this way. Um, there were also Armenian men, young Armenian men, who want to marry her. So before this case, many Armenian girls who were kidnapped and raped and then returned to the community, most of them were, were left because it was a shame for their father, it was a shame for their community to receive back to these women and to give them shelter. It was also dangerous. And most, most of these uh, women were dying. This was a turning point in the Armenian society, let's say in a very um, um, conservative uh, Armenian uh, province in Mush, where this girl was saved, returned, and then was married. She married um, an Armenian um, man who was uh, one of the uh, prominent Armenian uh, intellectuals at that time in the province who became a parliament member and she uh, and he convinced her to marry him saying you should say uh, serve as an example um, for uh, those girls who will share your faith in, in the future so this was a turning point um, in 1890s, um, Hamidian massacres uh, ha uh, happened in the Ottoman Empire, where about 300,000 Armenian men, Armenians were killed, mostly men. It was very gendered, uh, these massacres, because uh, uh, massive slaughters were happening uh, early in winter, uh, winter or in spring. Uh, mostly men were slaughtered and uh, women were raped in front of their community, in front of um, uh, their uh, children, and most of them were forced to convert to Islam and to become a part of a Muslim society. That was the way for them to survive. They, because uh, the, they were plundered, the, the, their men were, were killed, they were not protected, and and that was the only way for, for some regions, uh, for Armenian women to survive this. Um, and um, well, most of the survivors and orphans of these massacres of the Median period will also ha will face the genocide afterwards. And they will have a, a good to share their experience, what they went through during the Hamidian massacres. So, talking about the Armenian women um, in the Ottoman Empire, the position of Armenian women, as I mentioned, um, in the late 19th century, Armenians were, um, uh, there, there was an awakening of Armenian community. Armenians were going um, abroad. They were getting a very good education, coming back to the empire with a new knowledge, um, and of course, uh, in the uh, um, in the European part of the empire, in Constantinople and in Izmir, in Nicomedia, there were um, a women's movement started. Women emancipation, Armenian women feminists started to write their texts, and 
inspire uh, the women in provinces, and these women would go to have a good education, and they will become more and more visible in very conservative Ottoman Muslim society. If uh, we absorb, uh, absorb more closer um, the life of Armenian women at that time, before the genocide, um, women were going to the schools, they were having a good education, they were dressing up like um, uh, Europeans, but they were always, always in a trade of being captured or being uh, kidnapped or being raped. Um, so, and this topic of sexual violence was always present in Armenian uh, press, in Armenian literature at that time. But after the 1908 revolution, Armenians really believed that this is the time that they're going to live with Turks, with other minorities in the Ottoman Empire, uh, in a peace, and this is their homeland that they're going to um, build together and uh, have equal rights. Armenian had parliament members who were making law at that time, and uh, they were really believing that this new party, CUP, will change entire um, their life but they were mistaken. So, um, as most of you may know, uh, when the First World War started, uh, CUP used the war to, um, to genocide Arme Ottoman Armenians. And the Armenian genocide was gendered from the very beginning. Yeah. Armenian men uh, between 18 to 45, and then it changed between 14 to 15, uh, were a call to the army. They were used in the working battalions, and they were massacred um, in the first uh, year of the war. Some news came from, from, uh, from the front that the Armenian men were brutally killed and murdered. And uh, of course, before um, before the law of uh, calling um, Armenian men to, to the army, there was also an opportunity to pay some money and to stay home. So some Armenian families could pay that money and could save their men at home. And, uh, but as I said, uh, many Armenian men physically was more than, were murdered um, uh, in the very early months um, uh, amongst us of the Armenian genocide. And after, when Armenian intellectuals were arrested and killed, Armenian women and children were deported into a Syrian desert to die, basically. And here is the picture. The picture is from the Armenian National Archive. This is the, a small convoy of deportees uh, who are going to die in, in um, Mesopotamian deserts, and um, so for Armenian genocide, Armenian women and children forced to walk uh, thousands of kilometers from their homeland to Syria, and um, there are two phases of uh, genocide, the, the deportation and their lives in concentration camps. So um, some crimes, genocidal crimes, which was um, committed against Armenian women were uh, bought. Uh, uh, during these two phases, uh, Armenian women had uh, different experiences, but some crimes uh, they were uh, what uh, happened during the first phase of the genocide and the second phase of the uh, genocide. So uh, one of these crimes were forced marriage. So Armenian women uh, forced to marry uh, to a Muslim man in the very beginning uh, uh, when the deportation law came to the region. They were convinced that, most of them, that they should uh, convert to Islam because they, they are going to be killed and um, most of these women didn't have uh, men in the house 
The deportation law came with a strict order that they have to lock their houses to give key to the authorities and take what is necessary for, the, for their journey. So this was, let's say, the first time that Armenian woman, very patriarchal Armenian woman, who was always following the orders in a family which was given by men, had to take a very serious decision. And most of women were afraid to take that decision. Most of women were uh, thinking if they have a right to give that key of the house to the authorities, what will happen to them, uh, and so on and so forth. And then they knew also that being um, in a journey, even they didn't know what this kind of uh, what this journey would be, alone with the Muslim men armed. And without men, without the protection, it's something that they wanted to face. So what they did, they uh, took a decision to uh, sell some of their goods, to take money, and uh, to prepare for journey. Those who were uh, terrified um, also um, converted to Islam and married uh, local Muslims. Some of them gave their children, for example, to uh, a Greek community to, to preserve because they were af afraid, again, what can happen with them. And of course, we should not neglect the, 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 the role of rumor. There were rumors coming from different places, and these rumors were spread also by perpetrators to terrify them that they're going to be killed. This happened with other Armenian communities who were deported. This happened with those, and that was the way to terrorize them and to make them to uh, convert. And uh, the other aspect uh, that um, was making them uh, actually uh, to marry was uh, coming uh, from the top of the CUP hierarchy. Um, there was a law, they were not a law, there was an order, a written order to um, kill um, a male members of wealthy Armenian families and forcibly marry their wives, their girls, their um, uh, um, daughters and to become uh, this way uh, legal owners of the Armenian property. So. They were forced to, um, in this marriage, uh, to convert to Islam, uh, to change their Armenian names, and uh, they had not. Uh, they had to forget um, their Armenian language, Armeniansness, and never ever have a connection with any relative. So, um, and this is a quote that I choose to, uh, to show today. It's, uh, it's uh, taken from the uh, memoirs of uh, Amer uh, Danish missionary um, uh, Maria Jakobsen, who was at that time in the Ottoman Empire and who was working among Armenians. And this is what I uh, just described, the situation. So um, this is about um, Rebecca who was forced to marry uh, a man who killed entire her family and who was forced to go back and to live uh, with that man in uh, her father's uh, house. And she was only 12 years old. So, um, um, so they were, there was a difference between a married woman and a free girl who was never married. Of course, Muslim men preferred an uh, uh, unmarried a virgin girl, and um, but there were also women who um, married before and they had children. So, if um, uh, they had the children from their previous marriages, if the ch children, if they could convince the, their perpetrator to marry and to take their child also, 
Um, a girl child um, had the same fate uh, like her mother. They, she would um, grow up like a Muslim. And then her um, uh, new father will marry uh, her with another Muslim man. And that was the way. For the male children, for the boys, it was different. It was very hard for uh, Armenian mother to convince a uh, Muslim man to marry her and to take under his protection a male um, um, a children, boys. They were mostly were sent to the to, uh, Turkish orphanages where they were trained and raised as Turks. Mostly uh, these orphanages were um, kind of a military orphanages for, for male. So this is, if um, you are familiar with the Sierra Leone case or uh, with the uh, uh, child soldiers, this is basically uh, what it is. Um, so the other, uh, the other crime that was committed against Armenian women during uh, the two phases of the Armenian genocide, during the deportation, during their lives in concentration camps was uh, rape and sexual violence. So um, when deportees were walking, um, they were often asked to give their money to pay for their, uh, for their, uh, their transportation, for their foods, and uh, most of the time they were searched for the gold. Women knew that they are going to be searched. So some of them were even um, eating that gold because they knew that this is the only way to survive in this journey. But most of them didn't know these tricks or couldn't hide their money. So they were uh, undressed and they were forced to walk without um, even um, uh, underwear. And uh, uh, this was a common practice uh, during the Armenian Genocide. And um, these girls also very often were raped in front of their community. Then um, there were another practice to uh, rape Armenian women and girls um, in a sacred place for them. Uh, it was an Armenian church, in the altar, or in holy books. And uh, that was double trauma for them, because they were uh, ashamed, as they would record, in front of their God and in front of their community. And these um, cases happened uh, right before the, Armenian uh, the, the Armenians uh, were deported, and it was the way to actually made them not to think of coming back to the places where these crimes um, happened. And uh, there were women who committed suicide after this, and there were those who were strong enough to not believe that this is their fault, to convince other Armenian girls who were trying to, to end their lives saying that this is not our fault and our revenge, the only our revenge will be to survive this, um, what's happening with us. There were other things, uh, other way of um, ritualizing, let's say, rape. I was crucifying Armenian women and girls after publicly raping them. This was also used um, to terrify um, community and to make them to pay money for those who would come after them. So uh, there were several cases happened, uh, crucifixion of these gr girls happened in, in the right in the doors of concentration camps. So the deportees would come and they would witness this and then gendarmeries would uh, spread the rumor that this girl, um, she didn't uh, give what her family has, she didn't share her gold, and this is why she has this punishment. And if you don't wanna share her fate, 
you just need to pay. And this, this way of um, um, humiliating uh, women uh, was uh, also spreading this um, um, terror among them and to get, uh, getting m as much money as they could. The other um, thing that Armenian women experienced during uh, the genocide uh, in, during the both phases of the genocide was um, body destruction. So many Armenian women were um, uh, their bodies um, or their, their reproductive organs were destroyed after the rape. And it was very common, um, especially um, in uh, uh, deportation roads. So and again, new uh, deportees will come, they will see, and they were terrorized, they will be terrorized, and they had to pay more money to survive or do not have the same fate as others. So, um, after the genocide, um, those who survived were mostly Armenian women and children who were, who were captured by Muslims and who were living in Muslim household. And um, to save them was very uh, difficult uh, and another experience. So this girl is uh, Islamized and tattooed Armenian women. She is only uh, 70 years old. She was um, 13 probably when she was captured. She had uh, different owners. Uh, she was in a slave market. She was um, in a sexual slavery, but she could escape and come back to the Armenian community. What the Armenian community did for these women? Um, for Armenians, first and foremost, was important to um, rebuild the Armenian nation because there were no survivors. So every Armenian Armenian was important. But what to do with women who, who, who were caring, obviously, uh, the, uh, um, for example, in this case, the statues are um, a sign uh, that she was captured, she was married, she owned by other men. What to do with, with this woman? Um, and how to reintegrate them into the Armenian community. And with, within the help of them, rebuild the Armenian community was another challenge that Armenian um, community, mm, let's say, faced. So um, I would stop here and um, waiting for your questions. Probably open opening the floor for more sure. details. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yes. you.